Hello, everyone. Uh, we're delighted that you've uh, joined us this afternoon. Um, we're looking forward to a really active discussion about managing globalization. I'm Gordon Hansen. Uh, I'm a professor here at GPS. Uh, I study international economics, and I've been thinking about how globalization affects the United States and other economies for um, about the last 30 years, pretty much my whole career. Uh, joining me is Professor Munsab Lee, uh, who is an international macroeconomist who has done some very exciting work trying to understand the way in which globalization affects price levels in different countries, so the connection between globalization and inflation, and also understanding the, the forces that affect uh, how firms uh, are impacted by globalization and what determines their capacity to uh, compete successfully in the global marketplace. So to start off, I thought I'd provide just a little bit of context. Um, uh, then what we're going to do is uh, uh, have Moonsab address some questions related to one of the burning issues of the day, which is the existing trade conflict between Korea and Japan. We hope that we're going to be joined by uh, Kari Sumanen, uh, one of our illustrious uh, GPS alumni. Um, Kadi is uh, en route from Honduras and is facing weather-related plane delays, so uh, it will be a game-time decision whether she'll be able to, to join us. As, as a bit of context, um, you, know, you look around where the world economy is today, uh, and it's chaotic. Uh, the United States, Europe, Japan, and other high-income countries spent the better part of five decades building an architecture through which the global economy could operate. That architecture was based on open flows of capital between countries, uh, in part managed by the International Monetary Fund. Uh, it was based on uh, progressively lowering barriers to trade with each other, first through the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs and then managed by the World Trade Organization. And it allowed firms to develop very elaborate and complex global value chains, all of which fueled a tremendous process of technological change, uh, which has brought uh, improvements in well-being throughout the world, but has also brought lots of disruptions. And those disruptions, in part, are why we're seeing a backlash against globalization today. So uh, as a useful bit of context, I think it's, it's helpful to think about there being two distinct waves of uh, a globalization since World War II. The first wave lasted uh, from the late 1940s when we created the Brenton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, and the US, Europe, Japan, and other high-income countries began integrating. That phase of globalization was primarily about uh, rich countries trading with other rich countries and dealing with rich country problems. Um, because the econ those economies were relatively similar in the types of stuff that they were producing, it ended up being not that hard to succeed in lowering trade barriers substantially from where they had been after World War II. And so from 1950 to 1990, what we saw was a tremendous increase in market integration between uh, US, EU, and Japan, with countries in the West, rest of the world slowly beginning to, to join into the process. After 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, with economic reform in China and Vietnam, with the end of import substitution industrialization in Latin America, we all of a sudden had a whole bunch of new countries that wanted to join the global community of trading nations. That led to uh, globalization wave two. The big complicating factor here is that we now had a much wider set of, of issues that countries wanted to, to see uh, uh, that wanted to see addressed. That included China and India participating in the World Trade Organization and making a new set of demands that, uh, that we hadn't encountered before. And the rise of, of China in particular had major impacts on the global economy, uh, including huge increases in demand for raw materials and commodities that China needed to build its factories, but also adverse impacts on regions and industries that were producing goods in competition uh, with China. That the disruptive impacts of China's rise then led to an economic divergence between regions inside countries, which gives us the situation in which we're in today, in which we have the coastal cities of the United States and other tech centers 
and, and business service centers that are doing very well. And we have the US heartland, we have the old industrial centers of the United States that are really struggling. Uh, adding in here is the tremendous process of technological change that's, that's, uh, that we've undergone, which has brought trade in a whole new range of digital services. The, the rules that we built for governing global, global trade were about the old economy. They were about physical goods. Uh, they weren't about digital goods. And we haven't adapted those rules to, uh, to in, a, in order to be able to handle um, the complexity of, uh, of now a digital world. So the combination of the, the disruption that came with all these new countries participating in trade, the disruption that came from technological change, even though we're seeing new economic uh, opportunities for many regions, for many industries, for many people, we also saw a group of people who said, look, globalization's not working for me. The backlash then has led to things like the Brexit vote in the UK, with the UK now uh, looking quite certain that it's gonna leave the European Union, and the election of, of Donald Trump, uh, whose presidency is based on weakening ties between the United States and the rest of the world, and having US economic relations be governed unilaterally in terms of what the US wants to do, rather than through the multilateral institutions that the United States had helped uh, build over the last uh, several decades. So what we're gonna do today uh, in our conversation is talk about uh, these sets of issues. Um, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna uh, start by narrowing in um, on uh, a trade conflict between uh, Korea and Japan, um, which gets at uh, really the heart of, of a set of challenges that globalization is, uh, is confronting, and also shows what happens when U.S. leadership on the global stage uh, uh, changes, when the U.S. takes a step back from supporting institutions like the World Trade Organization, and when the U.S. allows other countries to really play a more conflictive role in, um, uh, in global trade. So with that, uh, what we'll do is I'm going to first turn uh, uh, to Moon Sab Lee, and we're going to address the, the Korea-China conflict. Um, then we're going to think about broadening that discussion to the U.S.-China conflict. Uh, and then what we'll do is, um, is open things up, because I I'm, I'm know that uh, with many GPSers on the phone that you're going to have lots of cogent questions for us and that uh, we can help move the conversation forward. So bringing uh, Muntab in, um, you know, we obviously have the U.S. starting uh, a number of trade conflicts, most, uh, most importantly with China. Um, but what we're also seeing is conflicts developing in other parts of the world too, uh, including between countries that have, have worked very closely together in terms of building global value chains. One of the most concerning conflicts that we've seen arise is between Japan and South Korea. So I wonder, Munsab, if you could uh, help guide us through what this dispute entails, where it came from, uh, and what are the ramifications for other countries, including the US and China? Okay, thank you, Gordon. I'm Munsab, assistant professor at GPS. So let me talk about the recent trade disputes between the world's the third and perhaps the largest economies, which are Japan and South Korea. It kicked off five months ago. So on July 1st, so Japan announced that it would tighten the export of the three chemicals that are critical for the South Korean semiconductor industry. So why did Japan target those chemicals? South Korea is home to Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, and those companies produce about two thirds of world memory chips. Japan is the largest supplier of crucial materials in this chip production. Interestingly, there is, there is an imbalance between the South Korea's import dependency on Japan and Japan's export dependency on Korea for those products. For two major chemicals, South Korea imports more than 90% from Japan, but Japan exports only 10 to 20% to Korea. So therefore, if Korea did not retaliate, I mean, this is not true for sure, Japan would lose less. 
So it only explains why Japan targeted those specific chemicals. But then, I mean, why are Japan and Korea in a trade war? So real cause of this agreement goes back in time, actually beyond the international trade. So let me provide a historical overview between two countries for actually the recent 100 years. Between 1910 and 1945, Korea was under Japanese rule. During this time, many Koreans were made to work at Japanese factories and mines in poor condition. Tens of thousands of Korean women also served as so-called comfort women who were forced to do sex work in military camps. After 1945, it took 20 years for two countries to normalize their diplomatic relations. This 1965 treaty aimed to resolve all colonial era claims completely and finally. In exchange, so Japan provided the South Korea with the total amount of $800 million in grants and loans. This was actually a big amount because it was more than a quarter of South Korea's GDP back then. However, several Asian countries, including the South Korea, insisted that the treaty was insufficient because it did not cover the sensitive issues like Korean comfort women. Four years ago, two nations attempted again to settle down on this issue. So after US President Barack Obama pressured South Korean President Park Geun-hye and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, the two countries signed an agreement settling the issue of the comfort women, which again aimed to be final and irreversible. So Japan agreed to pay $10 million to support the, the surviving victims, and South Korea agreed not to criticize the, regarding the issue anymore. However, the many Korean civilians and interest groups were unhappy with the agreement because they were not involved during negotiations. So two years later, in 2017, President Park Geun-hye has been impeached and newly elected uh, President Moon Jae-in made it very clear that South Koreans will not accept the 2015 deal. So Japanese government was also unhappy with the decision and the many Japanese felt naturally that the Korea is making it impossible to settle colonial claims. So this tension has gotten worse and worse during this year. So Japan removed the Korea from the white list and the Korea did the same. Korean consumers boycotted the Japanese the brands. Termination of the Gisomia, which is the General Security of Military Information Agreement, has been seriously discussed in South Korea, even though it was revoked two weeks ago. So I'm personally happy with that decision. Interestingly, the US did not play a global leadership role mediating the dispute between two countries this time. So many countries these days, including the European countries, US, China, are using trade as an acceptable weapon in countries, the diplomatic arsenal. And the US was among the first countries the bundling other disputes into a trade war. So the trade war between the Japan and Korea is not a simple issue, and it is really hard to predict when would it would end. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Munsab. Um, it's great to have that historical context. Um, and it reminds us that um, trade between countries is, is, is not always easy. Uh, that um, you know, uh, almost many countries in the world face uh, a difficult political and diplomatic history. They have to get over issues of past, past conflict if they want to cooperate and move forward. And indeed, it was the history of conflict which is the motivation for the creation of the European Union. And it was the history of conflict, which was the motivation for the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions. The US, Europe, and, and Japan did not want to repeat the two world wars that we had experienced in the first part uh, of the 20th century. So similar to the US-China uh, conflict, which we'll talk more about in, in just a second, there's a lot of context for the Korea-Japan uh, conflict. And that context 
uh, complicates finding a resolution in the near term. And the longer things go on, the less likely a simple resolution uh, becomes. We've seen uh, US financial markets react on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis to news where it appears like US and China are gonna agree to a phase one deal, help, helping to tamp down ten trade tensions between them. And then the next day, it seems like the prospects for, uh, for a deal uh, have diminished and, and mar markets get more uh, pessimistic. Every day that goes on becomes more likely that the conflict between the US and, and China is gonna become uh, the new normal. So with that as a point of comparison, Munsab, I wonder if you could take us through a pessimistic scenario uh, in which there is a protracted trade dispute between Korea and Japan and think about the economic costs uh, to the two countries themselves, but also the broader implications for China and for the United States uh, if these two major economies in East Asia don't find a way of patching things up relatively soon. So sure. So I think the pessimistic scenario is very likely, I mean, given the reasons we have discussed so far. So let me first talk about the directly impacted sector, which is the semiconductor industry. So semiconductors are critical for making the major components of the today's electronic devices, I mean, like your cell phone, like your smartphone. So Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix supplies over 60% of the memory chips globally. South Korean companies also supplies over 90% of the smartphone screens. The slower and the more costly production of those components could make them pricier. Ultimately, some of the extra cost phone makers have to pay for components will be passed on to consumers. So we do not see that yet, but we can basically run from the recent experience in the US. Trump administration did put heavy new duties, uh, increase the tariffs on imported washing machines in early 2018. The reason was that the increased foreign imports of the washers and the solar cells are a substantial causes of serious injury to domestic manufacturers. Interestingly, back that the main targets of the tariff were South Korean manufacturers, Samsung and LG. So how has that worked out? So the recent study from the University of Chicago this year showed that the burden from the increased tariff actually falls on American consumers. Both domestic and the foreign companies raised their prices on washing machines nearly 12, 12%. And they also charge it more for dryers because the most people buy both appliances together. So we could anticipate the similar price increase in electronic devices as an outcome of the current trade disputes between Japan and Korea. So let me talk about the one more thing. So the negative consequences of the trade disputes go much beyond this specific sector. So during this year, Police uncertainty has increased a lot in both nations, Japan and South Korea. So following the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index developed by the University of Chicago and the Stanford University, the current level of the political policy uncertainty is even higher than the Great Recession period in these two countries. So why is it problematic? So when the future path of the government policy is uncertain, the leading businesses and individuals delay investment and spending until this uncertainty has been resolved. So several profitable business opportunities has been and will be ignored. And if it continues in this pessimistic scenario, the last jobs will be created in the next few years, I mean, both in Korea and Japan. Um, so that's, um, that's a really interesting analysis because it, it, it gets at kind of three crucial issues facing the global economy uh, today. One is that the second wave of globalization uh, in particular led to the creation of quite extensive global value chains. So if you pick up your iPhone, you will see that the components of the iPhone were made in, in South Korea, in Japan, in Germany, in the US, in Taiwan, uh, in China, 
uh, the, in, the, the intellectual property behind the design of the phone comes largely from the United States, assembly comes from China, and marketing uh, comes from the United States. That, that, that sort of value chain has done wonders for companies like Apple, and is in part why Apple is one of the most valuable companies in the world today. Um, it's done wonders for the demand for electrical engineers and programmers and other folks who work at technology companies in the United States, in South Korea, and Japan, uh, and in China. And uh, putting a damper on uh, increasing the complications of operating these global value chains means that we're going to see that development run uh, in reverse. So the second interesting thing uh, uh, that you mentioned is this issue of, um, of uncertainty. And this is something that we've seen also in the context of the, of the, of the US-China trade dispute. That is, what concerns business is certainly the fact that they have to pay higher prices for intermediate inputs from China. And they're paying higher prices for goods that they're importing and then selling to US consumers. You mentioned uh, the cases of solar panels and washing machines. Other research coming out of uh, Columbia University and, and Princeton University shows that that pass through of tariffs into higher prices for US consumers and US companies that use imported inputs from China has been almost one for one. So you raise the price of a Chinese good by 10%. That means that the price that, that we're seeing in the, the US marketplace is going up uh, by 10%. So that, that as you mentioned, is, is one cost, one, one, uh, one drag on, on business in, in all affected countries. But the other one is that we don't know what's gonna happen. And so if you're Apple uh, and, uh, or you're Samsung and you're thinking about where do we wanna be making investments over the next five years, how trade disputes between the US and China and South Korea and Japan, how those get resolved is crucially important. And the fact that it's almost impossible to forecast where things are gonna be years from now means that investment is depressed. And uh, in an environment in which GDP growth in the US is already pretty sluggish, consensus forecasts put those, that GDP growth for the US at about 1.8% to 2% for the next several years, this is yet a further drag. Um, the, the third thing that you mentioned is also quite interesting, uh, and I wanted to get your, uh, a few more comments from you on this because I know it's something that you've done research on, and, and that is that the creation of these value chains has allowed companies to keep goods quite cheap. One of the surprising things about the global economy uh, since the global financial crisis, and, and even before, is the fact that inflation has been very, very low. There were many people who were predicting that the, that the uh, fiscal stimulus that the US engineered after 2008 in order to counter the effects of the Great Recession would lead to a wave of inflation as past instances of, um, of high, level, high levels of government spending uh, have done. Yet we've seen nothing of the sort. What we've seen is inflation stay at historically low levels. In fact, levels that are concerning to central banks because it means that if inflation is low, it means that nominal interest rates are low, and that gives central banks relatively limited man, uh, room in which to maneuver in the event that uh, uh, the US or other economies go, in, go into recession. So I wonder if you could help us understand a bit more about the connection between globalization and the low rates of inflation that we've observed in many countries uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. Sure. So extremely low inflation over the last 10 to 15 years, I believe that has been supported by the globalization. So why the globalization reduced the price of the final goods to the consumers? I mean, I first wanna say that this is the good news for the consumers. Low inflation means that you're the, basically, the price paid to buy the goods and services did, didn't increase much, but the U.S. GDP and the U.S. nominal rate has been increasing, say, by the 2% per year. So in real terms, in purchasing power, the low inflation below 2%, I mean, below the GDP growth rate, means that your purchasing power is increasing over time. So this is the good news for the consumers in many developed economies. And then what is the link between globalization and the low inflation. So 
in many cases, especially when the market is competitive, so the firms are going to increase the cost, increase the price when they face the higher the cost in their production the procedure. So what happened is that due to the globalization and the, the fact that now the, the countries are specializing on the industries where they have a comparative advantages, in this global economy, the entire the average production cost has declined thanks to the globalization. So that basically reduce the production cost and at the same time that also decrease the price level in general. So I think we should talk more about the effect of the, the, the globalization and effect of the, the increase in trade on the price level because the change in the price is crucial for the customers, the welfare, and then it has been mostly ignored in the current discussion I see, especially from the Trump administration, focusing more on the job creation and the GDP growth, but at the same time, so we should basically have a better understanding about how the price is going to be affected by the change in trade policy. Uh, that's a, a really important point. And, uh, and part of the benefits of globalization that I think have been underplayed in, in US uh, policy discussions recently where international trade has been been cast in a pretty negative light. Um, so I think at this point, we, we'd love to get questions from uh, the many folks uh, who are listening online. And so as you pass those questions in to us, uh, they'll get flashed up on our screen and we will, we will uh, dive in and attempt to answer them. As you're, as you're formulate, formulating those questions, I wanted to, uh, to touch on one point that um, uh, that um, uh, that uh, that Munsab had uh, had had brought up, which was uh, the hope from the Trump administration that these tariffs would lead to uh, job creation, and in fact, this was part of the promise that if we sealed the U.S. off from imports from the rest of the world, that would help bring manufacturing jobs back. Now, as a first point. Uh, the notion that globalization has helped reduce manufacturing employment, the evidence on this is pretty strong. Um, uh, there has, uh, the, the consequences of increased import competition has meant job loss in a bunch of labor intensive industries in the United States, like, uh, like clothing, like footwear, furniture, simple consumer electronics, and many other goods in which US firms have been unable to compete with China. It's also meant to job growth in a bunch of sectors where US trade with the rest of the world has expanded. So if you think about programmers and engineers who work in the technology sector, if you think about management consultants who uh, work in for, or for big consulting firms or accountants, uh, folks in, in investment banking, business services in general, where the US has been very strong. It's also been true in higher education. Higher education is an export industry and the US is a world leader in the export uh, of those uh, services. Yet it, it raises the, the, this question of uh, would, um, uh, would increasing uh, tariffs on manufactured goods brings, uh, bring jobs back? Um, I think our sense is that the answer to that is almost certainly no. Uh, and one reason for that, uh, an important reason for that is the jobs that were lost in the factories that closed in the 1990s and 2000s were, were jobs in 20th century factories where you use lots of labor to produce a uh, dollar, uh, each dollar of output. If jobs, if production did come back to the United States, it would be in new factories. And those factories are going to almost certainly be much more capital intensive and using far fewer workers to produce uh, each dollar of output. So our sense is that U.S. tariffs have been harming U.S. consumers, have been harming U.S. businesses, and have done very little in terms of generating uh, manufacturing employment. So we're going to take a um, uh, uh, first question here uh, from Julia Park. Uh, hello, Julia. Nice to have you uh, online with us. And the question is, uh, given that the rise in economic nationalism and voting is strongly related to the rise in globalization, and uh, President Trump's trade wars are increasing U.S. market prices and heavily impacting states which previously voted for him. 
Do you predict a continuation of support for economic nationalism in the US in the upcoming years? Uh, so this is a really good question and it's a really interesting one. The, as we think back to the 2016 election, um, Donald Trump's victory really came down to just a handful of states. It came down to Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, uh, and Ohio. Um, and he had to win the majority of those states in order to win uh, the election, which he did uh, uh, quite narrowly. Interestingly enough, those are among the states uh, that are, have been hard hit by, by Trump tariffs. Now this I think was unexpected to the Trump administration because they said, look, this is the US manufacturing belt. They should be happy to see uh, increased tariffs on imp imports from China. But what folks in the Trump administration did not take into account is that those same industries that are competing with China in one part of the business are also importing inputs from China in other parts of the business. And the parts of the business where US is competing with China, those have pretty much kind of gone away. And, and as a consequence, what's left is the, the parts of the business that really depend on inputs from China and, and the increased cost of those inputs is something that has led to a drag on manufacturing, including in the manufacturing uh, heartland. So my own sense, and having looked at the data closely, uh, specifically on this issue, is that the Trump administration has inadvertently hurt its chances for reelection uh, by harming the, the very states on which um, uh, the administration relied. Uh, Mutsab, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to, uh, uh, to that question? Uh, I would rather answer to the next question. OK. We can move to the next one. <laughs> Great. Um, so next question um, uh, from Tamara Shops. Thanks uh, for, uh, for uh, being online with us. Uh, in your perspective, how does globalization look different for developing countries in terms of economic impact? Um, in particular, uh, in countries where technology workers and engineers are not plentiful. So Moonsanab, I'll kick that over to you. Okay, so Tamara, thanks for this interesting and very important question. So let me tell you about, because I talked a lot about the Japan and the Korea's the trade disputes. So I wanna basically remind you the history of the Asian tigers, including the South Korea. So, so back then, the 1960s and 70s, the Korean government basically pro conducted the export promotion strategy. So they basically started from the light manufacturing, basically operators. And then in 10 years, the Korea basically successfully moved to the other the sectors, which is the basically heavy and chemical industries. So the globalization is going to have the developing economies to do this structural transformation because to expand your business to the heavy and the chemical industries, you basically need the basic income and you need to basically educate the people. So it is going to take some time, but I believe there will be the dynamic gain to the developing countries, even though they currently do not have those the skilled workers. So interestingly, we see basically the export promotion in one sub-Saharan African countries, that's Ethiopia. So what Ethiopia is doing is basically the copying the economic growth model of the South Korea. Export promotion starting from the light manufacturing and then expanding to, aiming to expand to the heavy and the chemical industries. So let's see what is gonna happen in Ethiopia in 10 years. And in 20 years, we're gonna basically see that whether the globalization have the economic growth of the sub-Saharan African economies. Yeah, and I think um, uh, the Ethiopia example is, is an important one. It's uh, surprisingly, perhaps, for folks who aren't following it closely, it's where China has really engineered major investments in expanding manufacturing capacity. Um, we're seeing similar increases in manufacturing activity in Vietnam and Bangladesh, which appear to be inadvertently uh, benefiting from the U.S.-China trade war. Many goods the U.S. was importing from China. Some of those were now importing from other countries, um, including Bangladesh uh, uh, and Vietnam. We'll turn um, next to a question from Lauren Hartig. Lauren, thanks for, for this question. Uh, and, that, and this relates to, to immigration, to people flows. Uh, in addition to trade, uh, what about managing globalization for programs like the J-1 visa, uh, which promote cultural exchange? So these programs are also uh, under scrutiny and facing 
and facing challenges. Um, so you're absolutely right, uh, Lauren, in that uh, the conflict over globalization isn't just about trade. Uh, it's about foreign investment and the role of multinational enterprises, and it's very much about immigration too, and immigration in, in all its forms. Um, not just cultural exchange programs as happens through the, the J-1 visa, uh, but through all temporary visa programs in the United States. Uh, we have the H-1B program, uh, which allows uh, high-skilled workers to gain jobs um, uh, on a temporary basis, oftentimes when they are uh, in line waiting to get uh, a, a permanent uh, visa to work in the United States. We also have increasing restrictions on uh, on visas that are available to multinational companies that uh, operate abroad and have operations in the United States, the uh, known as int uh, intra-company transferees. And we also have growing restrictions on temporary visas available to workers from countries with which the US has a free trade agreement. So what we're seeing is that uh, under the Trump administration, the United States has been trying to restrict the flow of people in every domain. This has meant challenges for uh, industries in the United States that rely on uh, these workers, and in particular, um, uh, in particular for um, for technology uh, for the uh, technology sector, for business services, including investment banking and management consulting. I was just at a conference with uh, folks in the hedge fund and investment banking industry, and they're terribly concerned about the inability to hire workers through the H-1B uh, program. But Lauren, coming back to your question about cultural exchange, one of the things that we've learned about uh, programs that, that, that create cultural exchange is that they have long-term benefits for the United States. One, one thing we know, so the, the US Fulbright program uh, both brings students from abroad to study in the United States and provides funding for uh, students in the United States to go um, uh, uh, work or, and study abroad. Uh, I know this quite well because my daughter is currently on a Fulbright fellowship in, in Southern Thailand. Research has been done that then looks at what's the impact of this sort of cultural exchange with the United States on democratization in these countries. And what, what, uh, what folks have found is that the impacts are positive. So that what you get is a positive transference of the institutions that make uh, freer democratic participation uh, possible. And if the United States shuts itself off from that sort of exchange, uh, the, um, the opportunities are gonna be, um, are gonna be limited. Um, so uh, second question from Rachel Hommel uh, regarding uh, if students are interested in learning more about uh, these topics, um, please email me and, uh, or email Munsab because we can direct you to uh, several recent studies that have come out through the National Bureau of Economic Research that, that provide very clear and cogent analyses of the impacts of, uh, of these recent trade conflicts. Uh, so moving on to, um, uh, to another question, uh, do we have, um, uh, don't we have to look at the trade conflict with China as part of a larger geopolitical struggle uh, at which times may override uh, purely economic uh, interests? So Moonsab, you talked about uh, the South Korea-Japan uh, conflict as having a uh, a geopolitical uh, uh, component to it as well. I wonder if, if you could expand on that to think about the, the geopolitical uh, component of the, of the US-China conflict. Okay, so we basically have a pessimistic view about when and how the trade disputes between the Korea and the Japan are going to be resolved because, I mean, it is not really the purely the economic the, the issue, it is the basically the geopolitical issue. So that's same for the US and the China. And now we also have the another party, which is the North Korea. So there is the very interesting the conflict between the US and China and the Japan and Korea are also involved. How do we deal with the North Korea? So I don't want to talk too much about it, but what I'm seeing very interestingly is that the role of the the US in basically the managing the globalization and the trade policy in the world has been the changing, especially during this the Trump administration. So when we think about the US and the China trade dispute, it is clear the geopolitical issue 
And at the same time, the many other countries are involved in this issue. So that makes, again, the future of the trade dispute between the US and China somewhat pessimistic and very uncertain. So I believe Gordon, you may have the, something to add on this the geopolitical issue. But what I want to emphasize that the, nowadays the multi countries are involved and that increases the uncertainty about the trade dispute even more. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I think your points are spot on. And I think uh, what I would add to that is in thinking about, you know, what do the US and China want uh, out, of this, uh, out of this trade conflict? Um, the U.S. has said it wants, uh, it wants China to address its treatment of intellectual property. Uh, it wants equal access to the, uh, to the Chinese market as, as Chinese firms get to the U.S. market. Um, it wants uh, the end of forced technology transfer from, uh, uh, of U.S. companies doing business in China. And then it, the U.S. also wants some nebulous things. It wants the China to close the trade deficit with the United States, which is a very complicated thing to do via uh, via trade policy. But I think that the geopolitics are really apparent when we think about what China wants. China's been a little bit cagey about how, what it wants to see other than the U.S. Uh, resolving its, its tariffs. But I, what I would see is that China's, games here, uh, uh, China's game here is a geopolitical one. China, won, one, wants respect for its role as a major player uh, in the global economy and that it wants its voice to be respected in terms of how important uh, issues uh, are settled. And China feels snubbed by the United States in terms of the role it can play in decision-making in the International Monetary Fund, in the World Bank, um, uh, in terms of being allowed to join groups like, and participate as actively as it would like in groups like the OECD or the G8. Um, and that China is not accorded the same respect uh, through the World uh, uh, Trade uh, Organization. I think the other thing that China wants, and this is more difficult to accommodate, is the freedom to pursue its policies that Xi Jinping sees as necessary for China to achieve its economic goals without criticism from Western nations. Uh, now, some of the things that Xi Jinping wants to see accomplished include a much bigger role of state-owned enterprises in the Chinese economy um, and a much more active industrial policy to promote tech, uh, high tech industries in China. Those goals run straight into conflict with the commitments that China has made as part of its membership in the World Trade Organization. So the geopolitics there are conflicting with the economics in, um, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in a pretty serious way. So that leads to a, a next question about, you know, what could an organization like the World uh, trade organization do to help, and this is something that I think economists have um, have thought uh, a lot about. Um, you know, the World Trade Organization was created in part to help countries handle trade disputes. When one country feels that it's being dealt with unfairly by another WTO member, you can bring a formal dispute. Uh, you can then enact punitive tariffs. That country is free, uh, to, uh, free to contest that dispute. But what we're going to have is independent arbitration of that dispute according to a predetermined set of rules. So I think a frustration that many economists have about the way the Trump administration has handled its conflict with China is that it completely ignored the dispute settlement procedures that the U.S. itself had worked so hard to create as part of the WTO. So that meant instead of the US working in concert with China, with South Korea, with Japan, with other countries that have the exact same concerns as the US over China's respect for the intellectual property rights, that the US has gone it alone. And that has undermined its leverage in arriving at, uh, at a solution. In fact, the US has not only ignored the World Trade Organization, it has worked actively against it by not allowing uh, new judges to be, uh, uh, to be named to the appellate bodies of the world, world Trade Organization that resolve these trade disputes, which means that as of next week, the WTO dispute settlement mechanism will no longer uh, be able to function. So uh, uh, turning to our next uh, uh, question, um, uh, and this is about uh, tai Taiwan's role. 
uh, in, uh, in the trade war. So uh, Taiwan may be benefiting in part due to the fact that some manufacturing orders are shifting away from, from Chinese factories uh, to Taiwanese competitors. Um, uh, uh, it's also true that labor intensive jobs in China have already begun, begun to move to, to other countries in, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia as we just mentioned to Vietnam and also to South Asia and Bangladesh in response to not just the trade war, but before even that started uh, due to higher, um, uh, uh, due to higher uh, 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 labor costs in China just as a result of its economic development. So uh, what then do we see in terms of the trend for Taiwan, even if uh, the trade conflict between the US and China were to be resolved? Uh, Moon Sab, do you wanna take a, a stab at that? Um, so I should tell you that I don't know very much about Taiwan, but that is very related to the discussion we had about, say, Ethiopia. So China is making the huge investment on Ethiopia, basically relying on the, 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 the cheap labor available in that country. And my understanding is that the same thing is happening in Taiwan and other the Southeast Asia the countries. So I'm going to basically rely more on you about your understanding of the East Asia, Southeast Asia countries. So the, um, you know, the impact of the U.S.-China trade dispute on, on Taiwan is, is hard to call. On the one hand, if the U.S. trades less with China, you might think that Taiwan would benefit uh, because it, it, it remains a reliable partner for the United States. On the other hand, Taiwan has become an integral part of global value change that involve China. And so there's no better example of this um, than, than cellular technology, where chipsets produced in uh, Taiwan are assembled into cell phones in China. Some of these are Apple phones. Some of these are phones that involve um, technology from our own Qualcomm here uh, in San Diego. And so Taiwan has benefited enormously from having access to relatively cheap labor uh, uh, in China. So as China diversifies itself out of the labor intensive parts of production, with some of that going to countries like, uh, uh, like Vietnam, but also to, um, to Indonesia, possibly to, uh, um, to, uh, 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 to, to the Philippines and Thailand as well, the question is, what, what role is, is Taiwan going to have in those newly constructed value chains? It appears that China's goal is to X Taiwan out of those value chains and replace Taiwan in the role that it's played. And so there's partly that's an economic objective, partly there's a geopolitical uh, objective. So um, I think the potential uh, for collateral damage to Taiwan in the US-China trade dispute um, uh, is high. So I think with that, um, we've come to the end of, uh, of your questions. If there are uh, any late entrants, uh, please pass them uh, along to us. Um, know that these are questions that uh, we at GPS are wrestling with uh, every day, and we're doing it in a bunch of different ways. Um, partly, we're doing it in our classes. We're actively teaching about what's happening with uh, the uh, trade disputes uh, in East Asia, between the US and China, what's happening with the evolution of the World Trade Organization, we make that central to our teaching mission. It's also central to the research that we do, um, understanding how changes in the global economy affect economics and politics around the world is, is, uh, is built into our DNA. But thirdly, it also matters for the role that we as, uh, as faculty, as students, um, play in broader policy debates. Uh, faculty at GPS are heavily involved in helping, the U, uh, helping uh, countries in the world uh, try and deal with the new and more complex environment. As part of this, uh, just as one example, a number of us here at GPS have joined with a collection of faculty from both the US and China to try and think about a reset on US-China relations. The current framework in which the US and China resolve their disputes doesn't seem to be working. So what we have done is to propose an alternative set of rules through which the US and China could help uh, address their concerns in a way that avoids 
uh, the, the very, very damaging outcome of a full decoupling. The world will be better off, the US and China will be better off if the two countries can find a way of sitting down and, work out and working out their problems. Right now, the prospects for that seem, uh, uh, seem a little dismal. Uh, and we're hoping that we can find a more constructive way for the two countries um, to engage. So uh, thanks to Moonsab for joining in on this really interesting conversation. Uh, thanks to you all for being on the line with us. Um, and we look forward to your continuing engagement with us here at GPS uh, and at UCSD. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon.